Radio Jones on iTalk FM. It is Radio Jones. We're into the second hour of the show and I'm with you through till seven o'clock. It's just eight minutes past six o'clock here now. And we're going over to the United States, to Washington, to meet a gentleman called Thomas Wilner, who is managing partner of Sherman and Sterling's International Trade and Global Relations Practice. Good afternoon, Thomas. Good afternoon. Welcome to Radio Jones this afternoon. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Thomas, let me just uh, introduce you. Obviously, you're the uh, managing partner of Sherman and Sterlings, which is your law firm specializing in international trade and global relations. Uh, but moreover, you are um, or you were counsel of record to several Guantanamo detainees in the two su- Supreme Court cases that established detainees' right to habeas corpus, which clearly qualifies you to be speaking with some knowledge about the situation in Guantanamo as we speak now. Um, Let me ask you if I could, first of all, to um, explain to us what that means, that uh, established detainees' rights to habeas corpus. What what exactly did that mean, and how important was it at the time? Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, something happened. Oh, (laughs) can you hear me? But I'm okay. There, go ahead. Okay, did you hear hear my question then? No, please ask it again. I do apologize. I'm sorry. Um, Right, just if you could, I just was mentioning there that you were counsel of record to to a number of Guantanamo detainees. Could you explain to us what uh, what it was, that what it meant to establish the detainees' rights to habeas corpus and how important it was at that time? Because that was some years ago now. Yes, it was actually when the um, when people were taken to Guantanamo, taken to Guantanamo, uh, the reason the U.S. government took them there was they really thought uh, this was a place under U.S. control but outside U.S. sovereignty, it's sort of a devil's island place, but not within the sovereignty of the United States. And the legal argument was that by taking the people there, they were beyond the law. They had no rights to hearings and no rights to any constitutional protections. And what we did in the um, in these two Supreme Court cases is say, well, that's wrong. Uh, that the law applies to the law which requires that everyone captured have the right to a fair hearing, at least an initial, even a cursory hearing, uh, had to apply. That's the right to habeas corpus. The first case established that as a matter of the statute. Um, then Congress under political pressure, abolished that statute for foreigners at Guantanamo. And then we went back to the Supreme Court, and they said Congress couldn't abolish it because that right to a fair hearing was protected by the United States Constitution. Under that, uh, many people got hearings and many people were released. Um, I can tell you what happened about three years ago in a very political move. uh, Republicans in Congress started raising Um, a lot of um, fear and said we can't release anyone from Guantanamo and they they enacted in legislation very very difficult restrictions on taking anyone out of Guantanamo let's go back Thomas uh, to to a point which actually um, reflects what you were just what you just said there and let me ask you if I may Um, you said at the beginning that the US government um, chose the geographical location as American territory, but um, outside of the the uh, mainland of America, where the they seemed you, you implied that they the American government knew that it could essentially get away with more than it could get away with on the mainland. When you were in court fighting for um, habeas corpus for your clients and other clients. What was their justification for doing that? Surely they had to be answerable to that statement. What, what, what was the answer to that? Um, it's, a, it, it's a difficult, sort of complicated legalism that went through, um, uh, that they went through. Uh, but there was, for many years, um, a debate about how far constitutional protections extended outside the United States. I never really um, was any question until after the Spanish-American War when the United States acquired territories outside the mainland. There were questions about how far constitutional rights extended to protect people who were not otherwise U.S. citizens in those territories. 
um, Congress or the, the Bush administration relied on language in some of those cases to say that <clears throat> because Guantanamo was, you know, part of Cuba and it under the lease with uh, with Cuba, the lease says that it is still sovereign Cuban territory. Based on that, uh, the, uh. the um, Bush administration made this very legalistic argument saying they don't need to give constitutional rights or hearings. We said that's absurd. As a matter of fact, one of the things I pointed out to the Supreme Court is that the iguanas in Guantanamo are protected by U.S. law. Any um, U.S. officer down there who kills an iguana can be prosecuted uh. for violating the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And I said, how can, how can humans be less protected? So it was a, a strange artificial legalism that the Bush administration relied upon. And, and uh, very uh, controversial and very hypocritical by the sounds of it as well. Let's let's move up um, to the present day if we can, because we've got a lot to get through. And obviously we've got the ongoing hunger, sc- hunger strike, which is spreading at Guantanamo Bay. We know that the U.S. military admitted n- last week that um, a number of inmates have been hospitalized and some are being forced fed. Do, can you bring us up to date with what the situation is there? Well, you, you know, we get reports... We don't see anyone except for our clients. My clients are on hunger strike. They tell us that almost everyone in the camp, except the very old there, are now on hunger strike. They're not eating. Um, some of them are, many of them now are being force fed through feeding tubes. Um, so we're talking but, around know, 150, 160 men, are we, around that there figure? There are 166 men still at Guantanamo. Uh, the estimates from my guys were that over 120 are on hunger strike today. Right. It started off with a few, and it started off, I was precipitated by um, how our clients felt was a, a mistreatment of the Quran. But the real reason for it today is just the utter despair and desperation of these people who are waiting around down there. More than half of them have been cleared for release, and they've been waiting for more than three years to be released. The others have been promised hearings to review their status, and there haven't been any hearings. Um, so these people are crying out in despair. And and clearly, um, you, you know, we, we're, we're sort of fairly clear that the American government uses the element of fear to hoodwink the American public to believe that these people are a threat to national security and are terrorists who would essentially um, murder them were they released. What, as as a... As a professional working in that environment, what is your, if you can tell us this, what is your view as to why the American government is holding these people? Well, you know, it's more complicated. I think that the Bush administration um, held these people and and played to the fear of the American public, and they had a view uh, that they should, they didn't care about human rights, really. They wanted to protect U.S. security, and they beat the heck out of anyone and torture them if they thought that was a way to do it. Um, I think that the Obama administration has a different view of that. Uh, But the problem is, uh, you know, honestly, this is a democracy. And in a democracy, you have different elements. And these people, who are 166 Arab men down at Guantanamo, don't have a constituency in the United States. Mm. So when people choose the priorities that they're going to address, Uh, For the Obama administration, they could put Guantanamo and these 166 Arab men very low down uh, on their priority list, and they can deal with things like the economy or other things. There are a few Republicans in Congress who, playing to their own constituencies, keep playing on fear, and, and they have put through these restrictions that make it almost impossible to Uh, to uh, transfer people out of Guantanamo, and the Obama administration and other Democrats have not stood up to it, in part because they see no domestic political benefit to doing it. It's the sort of issue that can get lost in a democracy unless you have moral leadership and courage. And yet, let's be... 
it, it, yes, that does explain it, but let's be clear about this. I mean, we're talking about 166 detainees and perhaps uh, fewer than 20 being what are called high-value detainees. But the costs of keeping Guantanamo open are horrendously high. One would imagine in the current economic crisis that the American public would be outraged by that, considering that the, there is a very limited threat from the inmates held within this um, particular prison. Well, indeed, indeed, it costs almost $180 million just to run Guantanamo as a prison each year. That's more than a million dollars per detainee. That's really about $90 million, more than $90 million just for the people who have already been cleared. That's $90 million each year. Beyond that, the United States is requesting another $200 million to re- the military is to refurbish the place as a, as a prison. So it's outrageous. I mean, we are spending, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to jail innocent people. Let me just say, the interesting thing is you're wonderful for covering this. In the United States, there's almost no press coverage of this. You can't get a story out. So most people in the United States don't know these facts. And so, and and why why do you think the mainstream media in the states do turn a blind eye to this, Thomas? I, as I said, I think um, in a way they is it sort of uns- unspoken, problem. yeah, in, unspoken in part censorship because Obama keeps saying, "Well, I'm all for closing it, but there are problems." So, uh, I, you know, it, it's terribly, terribly frustrating to me that they do turn a blind eye. It's almost impossible to get attention among the mainstream media in the United States. But is is it almost, almost a impossible. sort of unspoken unspoken secret that the mainstream media will back off from this issue um, for the time being, at least, until um, somebody has had the, the courage to actually stand up, somebody in, in government in, who, has, uh, who can actually make changes, such as uh, Barack Obama, has, has the courage to do so. Uh, it, it's, it's looking from the outside into America, it's very, very hard to understand why this is allowed to continue. And, and, and another thing, I mean, we, we're not, sorry to interrupt you, but we're not just talking, of course, about the 200 million that has been um, requested for That's upgrades right. of Guantanamo Bay, but more to the point, as I understand it, the department that was set up for to oversee the imminent, in inverted commas, closure of Guantanamo Bay, the budget for that has been, um, has been negated, has it not? In other words, it's yes, been taken no, back. They have abolished that office. And let me just say, I, I should say, I, I spoke about the economic costs, you know, the dollars and cents costs. Mm. But there's no doubt from day one, Guantanamo has uh, imposed much greater costs on the United States. It has. Um, it, it actually hurts United States security, and those who are expert in security matters have said this because it's the chief recruiting tool for terrorism around the world. Mm. Obama said earlier that it's really recruited many more terrorists than it's ever detained, uh, and he said very well, I think, that it really undermines the United States' strongest currency in the world, which is our moral authority. So it's a tremendous cost. Um, it's terrible. They have abolished any office to do anything about it. But what really happens is, you know, the economic crisis around the world not only affected Spain and Europe, but the United States, and people started dealing with those issues which affect them. That's why I say when you have 166 Arab men, people who are in Guantanamo, people put that out of their mind as a minor problem. It's a major problem because it defines who the United States is. It talks about what, what we will do. It's a, it's a horrible moral mm. crime, I think. And, I mean, as, as I mean, somebody in your position who's um, a hugely respected lawyer with an incredible CV, incredible credentials, um, working in the United States and representing justice in the United States, how does it make you feel? I, I am sick about this. I, I'm sick, and I'm frustrated, and I feel for the first time in my life really impotent to do anything about it. It's terrible. We won two Supreme Court cases. We fought this against the Bush administration. We fought to elect a president who believed that Guantanamo was wrong, that torture was wrong, that, uh, you know, uh, many things were wrong. We have Guantanamo open, we're having drone attacks, and there seems to be no debate. 
people turn away from it because they're interested in, in how high their taxes will be and whether the economy will recover. The economy will recover eventually, and those are short-term problems. This is a long-term moral issue. And Thomas, just to bring this to a human level for people to really understand, could you give us a, a very short um, background of perhaps one of the people that you've been representing? Well, let me give you um, uh, one. There's a fellow who I actually don't represent now, but I, it just uh, came into uh, focus for me. I was asked to do an interview on, uh, again, a foreign, a uh, non-U.S. channel on February 14th. Uh, and, and it was about a guy named Shakar Amr, who's an English resident who's been there for 11 years. Uh-huh. Well, February 14th was the 11th year that he had been in Guantanamo, the, the anniversary of seven, 11th year. It was also the 11th birthday of his youngest son, who he has never met. He has never met. This man has been cleared both by the Obama administration over three years ago and before that by the Bush administration. And there he sits for 11 years not seeing his children at Guantanamo. Now, I will say I, he's in terrible shape now. He's in terrible shape. My two Kuwaiti clients, both who are, are innocent, are not married, but both are in terrible shape now. Uh, you know, they can't believe it. And I happen to think all three of these men are there because they're very intelligent. You know, just because they're intelligent and they they sort of stood up for their own rights. Gosh. And I think they were problems because of it, and they're there for that. It's just so sad and so wrong. T- Thomas, it's interesting that you chose to give us an example of um, a British, uh, uh, British individual. Um, what about pressure from other governments in terms of their own nationals being incarcerated in Guantanamo Bay. Any any hope of any um, success with pressure from from a government such as the British government? Um, I I don't know how much pressure the British government has placed on the Obama administration. I understand from some of the British government people I've talked to that they've tried their best. and that the Obama administration says they can't do it because of political issues in the United States. They say that Congress has tied their hands, which is not true. Mm. They really could get Shocker Amr home if they wanted to. Mm. I know that uh, you know, the United States is so powerful in the world, both militarily and economically, that other countries also choose their own priorities. Uh, Britain is not going to pull away from the United States yeah. over one man. Yeah. Kuwait is in the same position. There are two innocent Kuwaitis down there. Kuwait is dependent on the United States for its securities. They push, they plead. The Obama administration shows sympathy to them, but pleads political difficulty. People just need to push, and most of all, the Obama administration needs to get courageous. They need to do the right thing. They need to appoint somebody to be in charge of closing this place, then close it. And of course, with the the ongoing um, uh, sort of posturing, I suppose, of the Americans um, towards other parts of the world, we we can think um, of their uh, influence on the troubles in Syria. We now have the standoff between North Korea and America and South Korea. Um, is Guantanamo perhaps essential, do you think, for the American government to hold on to with regard to any future combats they might be entering into in terms of what they would refer to as dealing with the threat of terrorism? No, you mean if you're asking, do they need an offshore prison yeah. to hold um, you know, terrorist suspects? No, I, clearly they don't. Um, you know, there are all sorts of places where you can hold suspects and you can interrogate them properly and not improperly. You don't need a, uh, an offshore prison to do that, a devil's island. I mean, I, and I would say that I think so long as we have Guantanamo, it's a symbol of American hypocrisy. Uh, it's a stain on our reputation, which degrades our ability to have an effective voice in the world. Um, getting rid of Guantanamo, you know, we talk about Syria and places like that. But I'll tell you, um, Russia uses Guantanamo as, as an excuse for, or as a reason 
that the United States doesn't have human rights policies. Is the reason they ignore it. Um, when people, when uh, U.S. hikers were held in Iran uh, and they asked for human rights, they said, we're treating you better than the people in Guantanamo. When we push around the world for human rights, for instance, in Latin America, what's thrown right back to us every time is you have Guantanamo. Mm. You're hypocrites. So it hurts us, I think, in carrying out our foreign policy. Thomas, it's it's actually, I mean, it's it's wonderful to listen to you because of your knowledge about the situation. But I am, it's, it's actually quite emotional. It's making me feel quite emotional listening to your despair. If I can ask you just one final question, which is very emotive, Thomas, if we do see a death um, in Guantanamo because of um, the hunger strike, what what impact do you think that's going to have on the on the situation? Well, we actually had a death about five or six months ago of a fellow who had been on hunger strike off and on, Anand Latif, and it had almost no impact on policy. Mm. And the sad thing to me is that I am afraid that these people, some will die, and it won't have an impact. It won't have an impact. Uh, you know, something will be said that in the United States, most people think that these people are all terrorists. They don't realize that most, that more than half have already been cleared. Um, so it, it, it's buried. It's buried in the news. I've got to, somehow we've got to get it out in the U.S. news media so people care again. Indeed. So. Well, it, it's wonderful to listen to you today. Thomas, I hope that we can speak again. It's been fascinating and, as I thank say, you. very, very moving indeed. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Radio Jones on iTalk FM.